This is our chief basketball expert. We've got a lot of pretenders around here, Mo and Zach and Haberstro and Amin. But the guy who is our real basketball expert is the guy who comes on here and says, as he did last time, that when Boston is playing against Golden State, Boston looks like the varsity and Golden State looks like the junior varsity. And he said Boston is just a lot more talented. And since then, all that's happened is that Golden State is on the cusp of winning the championship, rendering everything that he said wrong. Now, he did offer the qualifier. He said, just because the things I'm saying are so, does not mean that Golden State cannot win. But I am stunned, Stan, that the Golden State Warriors, with Steph Curry going 0 for 9, shooting 20% from 3, that the Boston Celtics three times in this series have been held under 100 points when they went the entire playoffs not being held under 100 points three times. I'm not really surprised by that. Golden State's defense is good. And one of the things I said the last time I was on, I said Golden State has a, does not have much of a margin for error. They have to turn Boston over, which they have done, right? They have to be able to hold their own on the boards, which they have done in the two games. Look, it still comes down to, to me, that the two things in that game – the other night were 18 turnovers from Boston to seven, I think, from Golden State, and Boston missed 10 free throws. They were 21 for 31 at the line. Boston has to participate in their own demise for Golden State to win. That's still how I look at this series. Boston is the bigger, more talented team. Golden State has been great the last two games, particularly defensively, but Boston has helped them a great deal, and and that's what needs to happen in that series. And I'm not taking anything away from Golden State because Golden State is not beating themselves, and they stayed in that game the other night um, and won it without shooting well. But I I, I still think everything I've seen tells me Boston's the the more talented team, and if they would quit beating themselves, can still uh, win this series. This is the first true transitional period I think I can remember in NBA history when you look at the finals. The last three finals, you get some altitude on it, pretty random. Warriors-Celtics, I mean, the Warriors didn't make it into the playoffs last year. The Celtics got bounced in the first round. Last year, Bucks, Suns, two teams that we haven't really seen in that spot. They don't get there this year. Year prior to that, look at how far the Lakers have fell off. The Heat are probably the most consistent team, and they were bouncing the first round last year. When are we going to get back to these dynastic teams that you can expect to be uh, to be there? Or is this the NBA now? I do think we have more parity now, Mike. I really do. I, I, I think you look around. I mean, look at the Eastern Conference when two games separated the the top four teams, you know, during the regular season. Um, we, we did, we thought we had the one outstanding team in Phoenix, and then they just looked like a totally different group once the playoffs hit. But, yeah, I think there's a lot of parity right now. And I do think a lot of people pointed out, even coming into the finals, that neither one of these teams were certainly great teams based on what we've seen from some champions in the past. So um, I think Boston is a team you look at going forward as certainly one of, if not the team to beat in the, in the coming years, whereas Golden State, you know, will stay on top for as long as they can, but should be on a little bit of a decline. But yeah, there, there's a lot more parity now. And I think a lot of teams will go into next year feeling like they've got as good a shot as anybody. The Suns' postseason story arc was really strange. Granted, they had injury. They got blown out in a fashion at home on Game 7 that was so weird. There's been some reporting done that we haven't really discussed on the show since. that They, they were dealing with a COVID outbreak while, while they were playing. Eddie Johnson did a, a radio interview where he kind of alluded to Chris Paul ha- actually playing with COVID. It was perhaps a reckless interview, but is that too much to read into there? Or do you think that COVID might have perhaps nuked this season? Because you said we had the one team that we thought we knew was good, Phoenix. And that, that offseason went off the rails in very quick order, and it was bizarre. Might it have been COVID? I would find that 
hard to believe that they actually knew that. First of all, you would be saying that a team was testing people and ignoring it. And I, I just don't see that happening based on what what goes on. There may be some people who sus, you know, who suspect that people on the team had COVID and weren't tested for it. It sounds to me more of a search for an excuse for a team that won 64 games and performed so poorly in the playoffs. That, that's what it uh, seems like to me. I love the coach that dismisses a worldwide pandemic and the possibility of illness showing uh, some variables that throw some randomness into the mix. I love that he dismisses it as an excuse. I don't dismiss as it. I'm just excuse. dismissing excuse. proof of it. And I do get tired of, I will admit, every time somebody loses that is supposed to be good, we want to make an excuse for them. It's an injury. It's something else. Hey, maybe they just got their ass beat. Yeah, but you don't do maybe they got their ass beat. You never want to say it's an explanation of an injury. You're the, you're from this code of the sport. I can't make an explanation, make it sound like this is the reason that I lost without it sounding like an excuse. I, I By your way of thinking, it's always that someone got their ass kicked. Well, that's the way it should be. I mean, we should be talking about what happened on the court. I mean, there's certainly injuries. And of all teams to be making excuses, let's not make it the Phoenix Suns who advanced to the finals last year with an a, a, an important opponent hurt in every single round of the Western Conference playoffs. Like, let's stop with that. Like, that one drives me crazy. We get our excuse if we have something. But, oh, last year, if you remember, they bristled at anybody mentioning that they had any luck in the playoffs, even though they were down 2-1 to the Lakers before Anthony Davis predictably got hurt, you know, and then got to play, you know, Denver without Murray or Porter and then got to play the Clippers without Paul George or Kawhi Leonard. That wasn't any luck whatsoever. They were simply the best team in the West. But now get your ass beat, and it's, well, you know, we actually had guys playing with COVID. Stan, is it concerning to you that Anthony Davis hasn't shot a basketball since April? <laughs> no. I, I think you get to certain points in, the, uh, in your career that really <laughs> being off the floor in, uh, in the offseason is probably not a bad idea for these guys. I mean, it's all about getting in shape, strengthening your body, in the whole thing, he's got plenty of time to uh, to gear up before training camp. I love, okay, Stan, I don't know whether you've been able to get out on the pontoon boat or not or whether you're going to go in the next couple of days, but you seem uh, that you're a little bit on edge. You're a, you're a little extra ornery today, and I'll tell you why I think so. You just hit Anthony Davis cruelly. It was a scissor kick and it was a razor when he predictably got hurt. That predictably was a talent that you that you uh, smeared across his face in a way that felt cruel, hitting him with predictably hurt. Well, I mean, it, it, let's. It certainly wasn't one where you'd be like shocked <laughs> that Anthony Davis got hurt. It would be like. It's saying, oh, my gosh, Jimmy Butler's going to miss a game. I mean, like, you can't be too surprised when those two guys don't play. They don't play that much basketball. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, the interesting thing to me, though, is Anthony Davis gets absolutely crushed by, by people for the amount of games he misses and – you know, the guys on my network calling street clothes and the whole thing. And Jimmy Butler gets none of that treatment for all of the games he misses. Like, we just accept Jimmy's a really tough guy, which he is, and the whole thing. And so his missed games are are no big deal. And there isn't that big a difference in the number of missed games over the last three or four years between Jimmy Butler and Anthony Davis. But, Stan, you don't think Jimmy Butler earns a lot with what he did in the playoffs and 
that game six coming off of that injury and it appeared as though he was done for those playoffs and somehow found a level of performance that nearly got them to the finals? I find that remarkable. And I mean that in every sense of the word that this guy played so poorly in games four and five, and it was all because of the injury. And then with one day off between games and five and six, he had a remarkable, absolutely remarkable recovery to full health that allowed him to have those two games that he did. And incredible, incredible. I love that Stan Van Gundy, like I said, he's sucking down those Diet Cokes. He's pushing through a cough. He's toughing it out, and he is just <laughs> eviscerating people right and left with sarcasm. What else has you agitated and irritable this morning? Uh, anything, uh, well, everything in politics. What's got you really pissed off this morning? No, it's mainly that I have not been out on my boat and then you know, I came home last night from Atlanta, and we've got plans today, too, things we've got to get to, so I don't get out there again today. That's when I relax a little bit. I, I need to be out on the uh, out on the water. So we're keeping you from your boat right now is the problem. No, you're not. You're not. It, it, I would have Sounds blown like you are. guys off to be on the boat, but... Um, no, we've got things going on here. So, Can you just take us on a virtual tour, not actual, but just through the spoken word of your pontoon boat, why you love it so much, why it's a sanctuary for you, why someone near Lake Mary might be puttering around and they would see a shirtless Stan Van Gundy just reading a book on the deck of his pontoon boat? I would not be shirtless. I wouldn't subject anybody to that. Um, you know, I, I don't really know, Dan. I just... When I just get out on the water and, you know, it, it just feels differently. I mean, I relax almost immediately um, when we get out there. We never really have a, uh, a plan. We're not trying to get anywhere by a certain amount of time. We're generally not even trying to be back at a certain time. We're just out there going where we want to go and, you know, staying out there as long as we want to stay out, stop, jump in the water a little bit, cool off. Well, you I take mean, your shirt off then, don't you? I do, but then I make sure I'm underwater, and as soon as I come back up, I cover up. I, <laughs> I'm very sensitive. I don't, I don't want people, like, having to uh, having to see that. So, what uh, SPF do you wear, Stan? 50. Wow. Good for you. Yeah, he's a Orlando. He must. And so you never you have you ever had a bad experience with sunburning uh in a, in a way that uh, has made you a 50 advocate? No, not really. I guess it's more my dad's had some skin cancer. You know, I've got fairly dark skin anyway. I don't burn really easily, but I still um you know, I guess I'm a little uh, afraid of it now. Stan, uh weird segue here, but you were mentioning liking the, the feeling of the wind flowing through your hair on the boat. And it made me think of Joe Madden, who recently shaved his hair into a mohawk <laughs> before being fired by the Angels <laughs> while having said mohawk. Uh, yeah. What does this story do for you? Does this make you sad? Is this something that you would ever do as, he, a, he as was, a coach? He was trying to loosen up his team, and he got a mohawk, and no one explained to him that he had been fired until he got into work with his mohawk. Yeah, that's not that's a tough day right there. Um, I don't have enough hair, Jess, to have a uh, to have a mohawk. I mean, I, I don't know that you'd you notice. You certainly do. You certainly and, and no, I don't. Shave and I sides. certainly, yes. I certainly don't have it in the middle of my head. I mean, I'd have to go at best like a reverse mohawk. That'd be about all I could pull off. Like the fine um, bomb. Because I've got this big bald spot in the middle, which wouldn't lend itself to a to a mohawk. So. Um, no, I. Uh, but how do you I'd feel? How do you feel? How that. do you feel for Madden? Do you feel? How do, do you? I have a lot of questions. Uh, do you wear a hat to and from work at that point? Do you immediately go home and shave it? Uh, do you feel terrible shame as you're being fired while wearing a mohawk? I, I think you got to go home and shave it myself. I mean, it's going to take too long to grow everything else back out. I'd go home and. Uh, and shave it. That was an interesting firing to me. Um, it was just interesting how they were 27 and 17 and one of the best teams in the league. And Joe Madden was a good manager at that time. And then two in those next two weeks, 
he forgot everything there was about managing and became a uh, a terrible manager. That transformation from good manager to bad manager so quickly was was incredible to me. How do you snap a team out of a losing streak? You just wait for it to end? Do you try to do anything? Yeah, games? I don't know that you do. Like, thankfully, I haven't been in a ton of those. Though my first year in Detroit, we were we were in a couple of them, and and it's just tough because a lot of times, at least that I went through, you're losing several close games in there. You're not that far away, um, and you've got to get guys to just stay with it and. Um, you know, try to keep spirits up and keep them just focused on how to play and things like that. It It's tough. And baseball, I would think it's even harder for a, a manager. There's just not much you can do. It's it's an individual sport, well, really. Hence yeah. the Mohawk, but yeah. What adjustments do you make? Yeah, that first, uh, the, the first Dwayne Wade season, 03-04, you guys started 0 and 7 and eventually 5 and 15 and eventually clawed it back. Like when do you start to recognize that all right, we're out of this? Well, I, I think we realized that part early on. We just tried to get those guys. That was a young group. Um, and we just tried to get those guys to focus on improvement and we looked at everything in seven game stretches, seven games being playoff length and and they could see pretty clearly by the numbers that that we were getting we were getting better and better um as time goes on now to get your heads back above water i mean it takes a long time I and mean, we were still 25 and i don't know 36 and then 117 of our last 21 it just and then so it seems like it turned that dramatically but it didn't it just gradually got better and better and better and better but that was a remarkable group mentally as well as uh, talent-wise. Let's get to some show topics here with Stan Van Gundy. He's told us about Patrick Ewing being afraid of a ghost at the Fister Hotel in Milwaukee. Do you have any other uh, ghost stories, any other haunted hotels? O- OKC is reputed to be haunted as well. Yeah, it's a different uh, hotel there now, but um, the time we stayed there, Patrick was afraid of that one too. Yeah, he's... Uh, Patrick's definitely a believer in uh, in ghosts, so um, he's the only one I've run into, though, and I thought he was just kidding me at first, but he wasn't. I mean, he's seriously uh, afraid of the ghosts. But you have no experience with ghosts, you personally, no personal ghost experiences. No, I got enough trouble just with people that are alive. <laughs> Stan, do you believe that ghosts are consigned to the house or building that they are in? Or do you think that ghosts have the ability to be in multiple places? That's an interesting question. I, I just don't have much knowledge of uh, of ghosts and their, uh, and their lifestyle. What's your goddamn opinion? I'm not asking you whether you're informed. I'm not asking you whether you're a ghost My hunter. My opinion is that ghosts aren't real. Okay, well, there you go. That's a very strong Big opinion. Shout. Now, should you be wrong in the hypothetical, I, implausible though it might be, that you are wrong and that there are ghosts, that ghosts are real, do you imagine that they're monogamous to a home, that a haunting is unique to that home, that they're trapped in that home, or do you believe that it's a part-time job, that a ghost can jump from like a mercenary from home to home and haunt several homes in a neighborhood? <laughs> I would think they'd probably just stay in the, in the house that they... Uh... But their- wouldn't they have had to have died there? Like, if they died in a hospital or died in a car wreck, would they really haunt the home? I- but do they do they stay in the home because they're trapped there, or are they choosing to stay at the home? Oh, I think they're choosing to terrorize the people in that home, yeah. It seems to me like you haven't given a lot of thought to at ghosts all. before. At all, at all. Which is... Strange. I, I feel like that's a thing most people have I'm, thought I'm about. I'm with you, Stan. I, I don't. I don't no, think about. I don't I think guess, about ghosts at all. I don't all. think most people have uh, thought about ghosts very much. No, I disagree until you have you. to. <laughs> Here, here's a question. Here's a ghost question, Stan. If you were, if you were to become a ghost, and and let's say this, there's a lot of de- debate among the ghost community about whether or not this is true. But you wear the thing that you die in when you become a ghost. So let's say you knew that day you were going to become a ghost. What outfit would you put on in the morning? Oh, pretty much what I have on now, a T-shirt and a pair of shorts. I mean, the 
it would mortify me to think if you were right about about the outfit you died in, it would mortify me if I died in a suit and tie. And then we're going to be a ghost and have to inhabit a coat and tie for the rest of my ghostdom. <laughs> so you that's just that's appalling. What are you talking like about? Sharp dressed ghost. Winning, Winningham wants to be a sharp dressed ghost. I totally picture Stan Van Gundy. It's not just basketball shorts. I think it's boxers, a t shirt, and a stocking cap. There's definitely a oh, stocking cap. There you go. I should go with that. Yeah. Then, uh, other show related questions. When putting on shoes and socks, do you believe that someone is a monster who goes sock shoe, sock shoe? Oh, I wouldn't say a monster, but it's the wrong way to do it. It's got to be sock, sock, shoe, shoe. You ever do sock, shoe, sock, shoe by mistake or that you're not really putting that much thought into putting your shoes on in the morning? And so See, if I did, then I would take the shoe off and start all over. Really? What? Oh, so really? really? If you that did level a, of OCD if about if it? What did, are other OCDs <laughs> that Stan Van Gundy has? Well, that's not OCD. It's just there's it a is. proper way to do things. And a wrong way to do things, and you know you don't want to be wrong. Is there anything that you're that particular about, though? No, not really. Hmm. I love no. Stan as arbiter for proper way to do things. So, uh, opening the door for your wife of the car is that a proper way to do things? Yeah, but I, I will say that I I only do that if like. We're going out and, you know, she's dressed a little nicer. Like if we're running an errand right now, we run out and we're both in really? shorts and a T-shirt. <laughs> I, I don't I don't open the door. So for, I probably should, but I, you but only, I will say I you don't. Only but if we're going out feeling on romantic. a date. It's only he's feeling romantic. <laughs> right. No, but if we're going out on a date or even going to anything where, you know, a business meeting where we've got to dress better in the whole thing then i open the door for when is it okay when is it proper at a table to dip your chip in the community salsa well as long as you don't double dip it's i mean that's what it's there for even so on the bit not. of the chip that hasn't had any bite into it if there's like a, no, if, there, no, if, you, I, if I it's care. a big chip I mean, half the chip has been eaten, the other half hasn't i understand that you know, technically that might be okay. I would never do that. I'm not dipping the, uh, I'm not dipping the same chip twice. What is the science of that? Like, is there like, re is it really that bad if there's like with some saliva yes. on? Like, is it does it really become community transmission if you put a chip? If is is double dipping really that gross, or is it just a feel thing? No, I think it's that gross. Hmm. <laughs> is it proper to eat something, anything after it's fallen on the floor? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the five-second rule applies. Now, if that makes no sense, and I understand <laughs> that, but also wasting food does not make sense. So, mm. you know, like our parents used to tell us, like, there's all these kids all over the world who don't have enough food to eat, so don't waste your food. They would tell you that at dinner. I think the same thing applies when food falls on the floor. Stan Van Gundy is in his 60s, has he considered before this moment that many of the people listening to this are standing wipers in the bathroom? Uh, that's a you know, I had never thought of that. No, I had never thought of it one way or another. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't really have an opinion on that. <laughs> Are you not shocked that there are standing wipers? It's not something you've considered before. Are you not presently shocked as I present you with this information? That yeah, I'm a little I'm a little surprised. I mean, I want to know like who did the research on that. That seems like an interesting thing to do research on. It's more that the world is divided into two camps on this and there is no evidence to either camp that the other camp exists. <laughs> And so you have wiped one way and then you'd discover a whole new world in which there are other people that do something different to you. Okay. <laughs> Last question, Stan, before we get you out of here. Do you remember your original cell phone? Do you remember the first cell phone that you had? Uh, the first cell phone I had, I got in Miami, but I don't really remember Oh, no, 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 no. I do remember the first cell phone I had. I was in um, 
Wisconsin, and it was one of those big brick phones. <laughs> and you would have to take the bag with you. Like, we'd be out recruiting. I'd take this bag with me. Oh, my and God. And the reception was so bad all the time, <laughs> it was useless to even have the thing. How how much did it weigh? How much did it, the, the entire <laughs> like twenty pounds? I mean, it seemed like like what am I doing carrying this thing? I feel I mean, like no, it probably weighed uh I don't know a pound maybe, but it was such a hassle. It was so big, and like I said, it was so useless. Like I, I mean, you had to stand under a cell tower to get any reception. So. There weren't very many places you could actually use it. It was just crazy. Did you ever have a car phone? I did. Um, again, in Wisconsin, um, in the car I had there, I had a car phone. I thought I was cool as hell. <laughs> I, I still don't understand the technology of that. But wh whenever I watch the movie Liar Liar with Jim Carrey, it's the only portion of the movie that looks old to me. Is there key pivotal plot points that involve a car phone and it bumps me every time. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember having it and, and you know, look, very few people had it then. I, I thought, wow, like, look at me. I got a car. You got a brick. You got of a, luxury. You got, yes. I've got a $20 phone. I'm i I'm an assistant coach in Wisconsin. I'm sure it wasn't $20, Dan. A <laughs> uh, 20 pound. Excuse oh, 20 me. I've, pounds, got, a, I've yeah. got a 20 pound phone. That's worth hundreds of English dollars. Pounds, I remember hating the brick phone. I mean, you know, when it was still cool that you could even make cell phone calls, I hated that thing. I was like, this is ridiculous carrying this thing around. Stan, we appreciate that throughout the playoffs you were here to give us your basketball expertise. Uh, I don't understand. I don't think I've seen before a playoff team arrive at the finals where I discovered during the playoffs that they can't dribble as a team. I, that's well, not that is interesting. You're right about that, and that's been a big, a big problem and probably – and we said that coming into the series, probably their only real weakness as a team. They don't have a lot of uh, ball handling. This is the thing, though, right? When I make a team that much bigger than the other team, and I make the guard six foot eight and six foot nine, at some point I've got to. There's going to be some give on the dribble, right? There's going to be some. There's going to be some. The guys who are six eight, six nine, I can't keep expecting them to play like the five eleven guys all the time. No, exactly. And and look, one of the things we always say about the playoffs particularly the further you go, is your opponents will expose your weaknesses. And when they get back after hopefully a lengthy rest to some off-season work and getting ready for the season, um, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in particular need to put a lot of time in on their left hands. I mean, they really struggle when Golden State's able to keep them going left and get some pressure on them. And we know that Stan Van Gundy could coach him up because the second most viral clip of Stan Van Gundy is uh, him dribbling in a practice and looked absolutely flawless doing yes, crossover around the love crossover handles, tactics. Around the love incredible. handles. People You're were, a great ball handler, People Stan. were amazed by your ball handling skills. Well, I, I think they were amazed because um, when they look at me, they set the bar so low that it would have been hard to get over. I don't think what I did was, uh, was so remarkable. I just think people expected that I couldn't do anything. So, you know, that, that's that been a uh, hallmark of mine is set the bar as low as possible, um, and then you're much more able to get over it. You're here. <laughs> uh, Stan, one quick basketball question on the finals. Uh, we were kind of mini-debating yesterday whether the Warriors are good offensively yesterday or in, in game five of the finals, and because they missed so many threes – it seemed like they had a bad night, but they were they hit two thirds of their shots from two. Would you say that was a good offensive game from Golden State? I don't think they had a good offensive game, but it wasn't bad. I mean, I would say it was mediocre. They didn't get to the free throw line a lot. They did score 50 points in the paint. Like you said, they shot the two well. And the best thing they did, they took care of the ball. Uh, turnovers had been a big problem for Golden State most of the year. They've done a very, very good job here in the finals um, of taking care of the basketball, and it's one of the big reasons they are where they are now, up 3-2. to two. Stan, good talking to you. For those who do not know, he is doing great color commentary with TBS and TNT. Love hearing him on the games. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time, as always. All right. 
Roy, you've been haunted for months and years by the Tampa Bay Lightning. I think we can make an argument. I don't even know where you guys would go. Would it be the Patriots? Uh, across sports, three-time consecutive champions are not something that we've seen a whole lot of, and Stamkos does it in the most lightning way ever to the Rangers, where the Rangers score nine goals in first two games, and then in the last couple of games can't score anything at all. And Tampa Bay advances again to play a Colorado team that has won more games than it's played in the postseason, correct? They've won 40 games and only played uh, – they don't lose ever, no. right? They're, they're totally overwhelming. They are what the Panthers were supposed to be. They shoot a million times, they score a million times, and they're totally unstoppable. But they've also, from what I've been, what, what, I, what I've heard this morning, Roy, I actually heard a Stanley Cup Finals preview on the way in. I'm in on this series. Nathan McKinnon's narrative arc is actually really interesting because apparently he is like the the Tom Brady uh, in terms of treating your body well. Like he apparently mocks his teammates for eating sugars or sugars of any kind. Like he is that obsessive about Jessica. Why are you fighting with papers that are in your hand and distracting us from our? <laughs> Uh, at our Avalanche <laughs> and Tampa Bay <laughs> Lightning coverage. Trying to pull out some notes from the bin you for do, some what, reason. Like, what are you? What are you? Are you, are you, you seem to be wrestling post its. What are you doing? Well, Roy asked me to pass him a note that he wrote, and so I looked for it and I couldn't find it. So I was like, oh, I probably threw it away. So I was just rummaging through the trash trying to find his note that had a stat on it he wanted to read. Yeah, uh, it was a stat of teams in the NHL who have gone down 0-2 mm. to come back and win the series, and a stat where the team went down 0-2 on the road and came back to win the series. And I don't remember what the stat was and it's gone now. So thanks. And it, I, it's the only note that I have here. Uh, Mike Ryan's top five breads from chain restaurants. All right. Well, so, uh, that's an old I have note. a note We've in front of me that note, says yeah. 2011, Mr. Editor email lunch with yeah. shipping container. Shouldn't we all change NWSL? Olive garden was number four. What do we need to change? Uh, you got a fanfare over there. Uh, I think we've already done this list, though, and we've rummaged through a garbage can and not found the stat that we wanted to. I, uh, that not concludes here, our Stanley Cup coverage. Excellent work, as always, uh, Roy, when we lob it to you and you're ready to rush right into the breach. Oh, that one's my fault. I shouldn't have thrown it away. It yeah. Regardless, the Rangers scored, the, the, they scored nine goals in the first two games. Go ahead and look that up. How often have you gone down 0-2 allowing nine goals in the first two games? <laughs> and and, and won every game that followed, defending incredibly. But Colorado never loses as well, though. So this is if Tampa Bay is going, Tampa Bay is either going to conclude, punctuate their amazing three-year run by trampling what has been an overwhelming postseason team, or we will have a new champion that has dominated the postseason and knocks off a worthy defending champion. And the series will still be over before the NBA Finals finally <laughs> conclude. Unbelievable. My my favorite part about this Stanley Cup Finals, in my opinion, Dan, I think this series will provide the definitive answer on rest versus rust. Because we saw in the Eastern Conference Finals, the Tampa Bay Lightning had nine days rest after sweeping the Florida Panthers. And they lost the first two games because they didn't play enough in the intervening nine days. Now it's the Avs' turn to have nine days' worth of rest after sweeping the Edmonton Oilers. And if they come out and don't start well in their first two games at home, I think there'll be a real case behind rust as the definitive you answer this, a lot of time you're off. You full of shit every time, <laughs> yes, every year, are. every year. <laughs> Laid out I, a definitive I, I, case. I am so tired, though. I this The postseason, I remember Mark Jackson asked the question in one of these series where a team had a lot of rest and the other team didn't have a lot of rest. And his conclusion was at the end of his, we're going to have to wait and see. He, uh, <laughs> the he, wait and see approach. It's he just, was right there. It's <laughs> just, he is right. That is, that's, that, we that, did that, wait that, and we that, did that, see. <laughs> but this is going to be something that becomes things that people talk about that everyone forgets before sporting events that is just something to be said. There will be no definitive answer to this ever, Whittingham. No, there will be. There will be no hypothesis proven. There will be no theorem that gets uh, scientifically, empirically 
uh, proven. I have us 30 years from now going, you know what? 2022, Avs and, and what is it? Lightning. That was it. That was no. the moment. That was the moment. Was right. That was yeah. the moment. 30 years from now. It The pivotal series where we finally decided. We finally Russ found out. If the wow. Lightning go into the arena formerly known as the Pepsi Center and take two games ball. from ball the- arena. Oh, Ball yeah. Arena. Ball Arena. Yes. Wow. Like the ball. Mason draw. Ball draw. Arena. What? <laughs> Shouldn't it be Puck Arena? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, we play basketball there too, though. What? Uh, Jessica hasn't been the same since Greg Cody uh, mentioned on Monday. Frank Askrack. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Frank Askrack. She has not been the same. Oh, I missed that one. I had a yes. note in front of me, speaking of post-it notes, that just said Frank Askrack for three <laughs> days, Dan. I just... Why did, why did you write that down? I just, it's I, important. It was important. important. I just... Yeah. Frank, like Frank Askrack. I Documented don't know. for That's, posterity? Yeah. It's all I have is Frank Askrack today. Again, not helpful to the audience as you just blurt Frank ass crack. Uh, perhaps people haven't been listening. And Greg Cody, ass crack. Greg Cody, for some reason, made a second baseman from the past, just called him Frank ass crack. I don't remember. And Jessica, with a strange, one of the strangest Tourette's I've ever seen around here, just for the last three days, have randomly, you're just walking past her and she just says, Frank ass crack, and starts giggling. Frank ass crack. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, me you don't have anything else on this it's just something that you like repeating again and again it's just something that is has uh, contaminated your sleep and has become a singular obsession what am i supposed to have on frank ass crack he's not even a real person he's just frank ass crack well he would be good defensively probably second baseman you think so i think so yes why yes. why we play combo why do you why do you believe that he's probably got a good glove you never know what well, sounds like you know? Yeah, you you seem to you say you I never mean, I, know. You, you, you got out there with you got the out there with the opinion, the very strong opinion that Frank Gascrack is good at second base, and I think no, I don't think he's any good. You're saying he has to overcome his name in order to be a big leaguer for the big league team to put Gascrack on the back of its uniform. That's right. I think he's going to get a Gold Glove. I think so. Wow. I like that Tony has control over his own mic, and he's still doing the off mic show right now. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of off. There's been a lot of off mic show this week. And it's like it's it's difficult to handle like when I like when you're speaking and there's yep. off mic show going on. It's like do I stop and allow the off mic show to be heard? Can people hear it? I Sometimes don't I, I really don't understand why everyone in our environment is so comfortable doing a show off the microphone that heckles the show that's being done that pays all of us. Like to me, I don't understand <laughs> I, I the the reasoning process it, of having such a loose environment that's two got uh, refuses to show up for work and refuses to <laughs> tell anybody that he's out of uh, work range, and that then results in we, you know, Billy's not even here today. He's the one who loves to throw it off mic to a show that doesn't exist and isn't on a microphone. Right, but it's it's that heckling too. It's like, was there a really good joke in there? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to the audience that we're deconstructing how we do our job, but it is like sometimes well, I, very but, disorienting. No, but I just don't understand why it's okay to heckle the show and not have it aired so the audience can enjoy the heckling. It doesn't. Oh, seem... but the moments where you just you hear it peeking through. Yeah. You call it peeking yeah, show. Peeking show can break out sometimes, and you like you uh, just hear it maybe in your AirPods. It's like, oh, I caught it. It's a little Easter egg. I caught a little stray that went shooting past a microphone that was supposed to be off that for some reason was on, even though Tony is now sitting in front of a microphone and still doing the show where he heckles the people doing the show. Well, Dan, sometimes that show ends up coming into the show and being part of the show, right? Somebody will hear something, and then that'll get you know, pass to whoever's sitting up there, and then I get passed to you. So it's a way of doing the show within the show. But what I really want to talk about is why we don't have enough short shorts. Yeah, so when you described earlier the ball arena, we lost Jessica because there is a great tweet on the internet about short shorts. I don't know if you know, I don't know if you noticed this, Dan, but men are wearing a lot shorter of shorts than they ever have before. I think there are a couple of fashion trends that are coming back into 2022 culture that will be photographed, and in 20 years from now, we'll go, what the hell are we doing? I think our obsession with denim, I think uh, there's never been more denim. Jean jackets, shirts, pants, yeah. there's so much denim. And I remember this in the late 90s, and we regret it. And for some reason, we went back to it. The short shorts has made a comeback, and it's 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 unbelievable. Like, you can't make shorts short enough. And Jessica found an uproariously funny tweet about how short shorts can get. 
Well, we'll get to the tweet, but I think, Woody, you're mistaken in that. We're not going to look back on short shorts and think, what were we thinking? I think right now we're looking back on long shorts and thinking, what were we thinking? Yeah. And yes. so now like we're like just, below the knee, yes. like, oh, my God. Shorts. We're just going oh, back to what actually looks good, which is, yes. you know, showing some thigh. Show some thigh, yeah. Uh, there was a clamoring for men to wear short shorts. Yes, there was a clamoring apparently. to have hairy thighs unleashed upon the Ooh, American right. and the international viewing public. Have you noticed this has made its way to basketball as well? Shorts are shorter than they used to be. They need and, to be shorter. I, well, the thing is, though, Tony, is that the Fab Five brought in long shorts for a reason. And it's because the short shorts that looked like they were going to reveal something were not fun to look at. It was not nice to look no, at players no, in the no. 80s with shorts that when you know, four-fifths of the way up someone's thigh. Opinion. Larry Bird is your opinion. That's your opinion. opinion. It looks so old. When you see a basketball player, like, I associate bad old basketball such a with bad short team. shorts. Yeah, Pat Cummings. Oh my God, such yes, a bad I mean, team. John Stockton used to do it, too. I don't think of him as height of fashion. I was unaware, though, that this was a thing that had a recent clamoring. I did not realize that it is a new now fashion trend. I have not noticed walking around the beach that more men are wearing shorter shorts. Absolutely. And when Chris talks about the basketball the, the phenomenon in basketball had a lot to do with hip-hop at the time and, like, what they were wearing, right? Like, everything in the early 2000s was baggy and big. I remember Soldier Boy wearing uh, jean shorts that looked like jeans, but they were actually shorts. He used to wear the super long white tees, and, like, that was the style. So they were bringing in that style into the NBA and into college basketball and into wherever. All of a sudden, you can't find a basketball player under 25 that will wear shorts past anywhere close to their thigh. Like yeah. the the best most elite players are wearing shorts that are like up to here. Oh, come on, man. Yeah. Along alongside with it, it was a little that, pale. Like, it was a lot of so hair and of some legs. paleness. Well, I, athletes. Like, Stugatz is really bummed that he was not here for that. As Tony oh, hiked up, oh, Dan, in Hawaii, I was. in Hawaii it was like one inches. The shorts. Hmm. I don't. I don't need to see that. I don't need to see that. And and the reason why Jack, is that why you question, immediately came back and lost uh, weight. Maybe. Oh my God! This to, to, to answer your question, Jessica, it's because we don't violation. we don't work on our tan as like we're not walking around on the beach working on our tan all the time, and so there's hair, there's whiteness, so what? and it's unpleasant. That's what the human leg looks like. Exactly. Free the leg. Exactly. It's, you know what? And, and and just talking in terms of sports performance, I imagine playing a sport, and, and I used to play soccer, uh, which the the style's a little different, but I imagine playing a sport where the pants and their shorts are so big and baggy is actually harder oh, than playing with something that fits you a little bit better and isn't going to bug you because it's too big for you. Are you alleging the Fab Five would have won a national championship if they didn't wear shorts that long? I mean, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that like I, the style doesn't necessarily mean that it's functional. Hmm. I just don't think most men listening to this say, you know what the world needs more of? My upper thigh. Right. The people that are listening to this do sh definitely should not wear shorter shorts. But there are some what? people what? that should wear shorter about shorts. Our, our, audience. our audience. accusation. No, our audience tends to be guys that wear long shorts, and that's okay. But I'm just saying. It doesn't feel like you think it's okay. You I just, don't. You I don't think it's okay. Your, podcast audience. I don't think it's okay at young. all. They need I to think... start wearing. Un anything under seven is where we should start. Seven inch shorts. Yeah. Seven inch inseams, excuse me. That's right. Where is that roughly on the leg? Is that like kind seven, of just seven just, inches, just, yeah. just above the knee? No, that's actually probably right around mid thigh. Tony is right showing, ah, Tony yeah, like is right showing right a right place. Uh, yes, yeah. Roy like is getting uh, uncomfortable like right uh, because he's showing the pale part of his thigh, a thigh that has not seen sun. No, that is not. Oh, Dan, it's seen a lot that, of sun that in that Hawaii. Thigh has had, seen sun. That look. Look how. His Instagram give me a break. Look at that. Come on. <laughs> I mean, just wear whatever shorts make you comfortable. And I'm happy now that people have the option to show a little thigh That's right. if they want. That's right. Roy, put it on the poll, please, at Lebetard's show. Are you confident in your upper inner thighs?